And now time for a simple game. Uh, maybe not. Aura and Labor by Uwe Rosenberg is a game in his series that has a, such a steam title as Agricola. La Ha. Uh, game no one remember. And then Aura and Labora. And it plays like the first two games in the series somewhat. In fact, let me show it to you. Although, be forewarned, there's a lot in this and I'm only going to give you an overview. is a fairly complex game. Well, I guess complexity is kind of pushing pushing the right words there because it's not that difficult to play. But there is a ton going on. In fact, there's multiple rule books that come with the game. You have a whole page here on how to set the game up. Then you have what we call the detailed gaming rules, which go into all the rules of the game. And then there's a sheet that just tells you all the different buildings you're supposed to give that to everybody else. Then there is a very detailed building index where you can look up any building in the game and it tells you exactly what it's about that. And then I believe there's even another general rules where these are basically how to play the game simply. That's a lot going on. But all that being said, I could probably teach the game in 10 minutes to some people. Now, I'm not going to go over every rule of the game here. In fact, I'm not even opening up all those pieces. I did it once for the component dump. But there's a lot of components in the game. Let's, we'll look at a few of them here. There's a lot of resources in this game. And the resources are all double-sided. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're related. It just means that some resources are on one side and some are on the other. The only one that is related is this one. Grain can be changed into uh, the wheat anytime you want. And you can flip them back and forth if you like to. Now these, t these tokens have different things on them. Some of them, like this one here, has victory points on it. Other ones will have energy on them. And others will have food on them. And those are used for specific functions during the game. Each player has their own board that they're going to have in front of them. And this board has some buildings already on it. You can see how this board has three buildings placed on it. And at the beginning of the game, you're also going to fill it up with some some swamps and some forests okay and the swamp and forest cards are double-sided so you can stick those on and each player is going to get three clergymen and one of them shaped a little bit differently than the other he's the the abbot but other than that the main focus here is going to be on this wheel now i'm going to talk about a four-player game there's some slight differences for a three or two player game but they all play pretty much the same this is how a round works the first thing we do in a round is we look at your, everyone looks at their thing. And if you have three people in your buildings, then you need to take them all out. If there's only two in a building, too bad. Okay? The second thing we will do is we will rotate this wheel one. It's going to keep clicking. Now, the wheel rotating isn't so critical. It's that these numbers in the middle change. You can see here that there's a bunch of tokens for each resource. All these tokens now have a number next to them that says two. And as the round changes, the number is going to progressively change. And these tokens are going to be moved around. So different resources will be a certain, there will be a certain number of those resources available. I'll come back to that in just a moment. Then each player gets one action. And whoever starts each round is going to get two actions. So he'll start, the other players will take an action, then he gets another action. And then bam, we go to the next player. They get to start the next round where they get two actions. All right. Actions that you can take on your turn. One of them is by using a building. You just put a guy in one of your buildings and you do whatever that action is. For example, going in here to the clay mound will give you clay. Now how much clay do I get? Well, I look at the wheel. Let's say this was the round I decided to do it. The clay here is at six, so I would get six clay tokens. I would then move the clay token all the way to the zero spot on the board. And we have to wait as rounds go up for the clay to keep ticking. So you can see whichever resources are to taken are going to get bigger. You can also, whenever you want this little orange square as a wild token, I could have used that to take the clay. You can always use the wild token. So you can see down here, here's one that gives you money. Here's one that you can get either grain or you can get sheep. You can also, instead of putting one of your guys in a building, you can also take one of these and harvest it. You take this card off, which allows you to build a building there, and also gives you either wood or gives you peat. It's your choice on which one you get rid of. 
So you have those to get rid of, and it works the same way. I'll take a certain amount of wood and then move the token. Okay. Now, as a free action on your turn, there is a stack over here of land tiles, and you can build one of these. Each of them has a cost in money, and you can build one and attach it to your area. So when I build it, I can place it like this, or I could flip it and place it like this. Each new of these land areas that I build will come, this one comes with two forests and another swamp on it, so I can get more resources. But it also gives you more places to build. And you can see there's different color backgrounds because different buildings can be built uh, in different areas. Just like you can also, instead of buying that long one, you can buy a short one. That can go like this, so you have mountains. Or you can go here, so you're next to the beach. And you can build these. You can build one of them per turn as long as you have the money to do so. Which leads us to the, the final action. And before I go to the final action, I guess I should mention that you can use other players' buildings. Uh, but you have to pay them a dollar, and they will stick one of their own guys in the building, so you kind of effectively stop them from using the building, but they do get a dollar out of it. You can build buildings, and you can see here's a whole bunch of starting buildings on the board. And each of these buildings, for example, this one, the Cloister Courtyard, costs two wood to build, and you can see it's worth four victory points at the end of the game, and it has a little red number, four, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But this, when this building's used, it lets you change in three different goods for six identical basic goods. And so this one gives grapes. This one lets you change money in for, for grain. Uh, this one here, I can trade in fuel for money. And so there's different buildings that players can build, and if you have the resources that you need to build it, you simply pay those resources, and then you'll take the building, and you'll place it in your area. There's really no restrictions uh, for the most part, except you look up here, you know, this will say coast, plains, or hillside. Well, plains, that's easy. I can put it there, or I could have even put it on the coast. It said I was allowed to do that. Uh, sometimes some of them are more restrictive, like the windmill can only go on the coast or the hillside. And there's even one building that can go into the water, a houseboat. Now, as players are building these buildings, as, as they're building them, they have to kind of watch where they're putting buildings for two reasons. One is because these buildings here, the Priory buildings, they have a yellow background. They must go next to other yellow backgrounds, buildings. So you could kind of box yourself out. So you, some buildings you would not be able to build. Also, as the wheel progresses around the board, it's eventually going to reach this little house token that's been placed here. After that house token has been placed, it will be put on another spot and you'll keep going around the board. But as this token is put on the, when you get to that token, each player is going to look at the cards that they have in their hand and they have a chance to build one of these cards from their hand. And these dwelling places that they build are worth points at the end of the game equal to the red value of the buildings that's next to them. So these are interesting buildings because they don't really do much for you. They cost, but when you put them down, where you put them down in your village is going to make a big deal in how many points you're going to get at the end of the game. Also, when that house thing comes up, we're going to go into the deck of cards and we're going to pull out a whole pile of new cards that will come out in phase A and then B and then C and then D. And eventually all these buildings will be out and you'll have tons of buildings that you'll have built. And also more of these dwelling places will be available for each person to use as the time goes by. After a certain amount of rounds, and again that depends on the number of players, the game is going to be over. And players are going to get points for all the point tokens that they have on their resources. They're going to get point tokens uh, for each of the buildings that they own, uh, including those dwelling places that get points for buildings next to them. And whoever has the most points is the winner. Some resources are worth not worth a lot at the end of the game. They're worth a lot during the game, like clay is really worth nothing, but it's good for building. However, later on, this pottery is worth three points. You might be able to convert it into more points, but if nothing else, every pottery you have is worth three points. Now what I just did was I gave you a very, very general overview of the game, but that's how the game takes place. It's all about getting these resources and building buildings into proper places and using the buildings to change resources into other resources. Whoever has the most points, like I said, is the winner. One more thing I wanted to point out was that in this game you can play two scenarios. You can play in Ireland or in France. Every building is, so you can see this is the French, French building, the windmill, but if I flip it over, it's a mold house in Ireland. The priory in France is, oh, still a priory in Ireland. So every building might be different. There's not a huge amount of difference. Bakery to brewery, carpentry to cottage. Uh, but there is a lot of minor differences 
And so you'll notice a different feel to the game. There's also some resources like grapes are available in the French game, while in the Ireland they have malt. So there's different resources that are available in both. So if you get really bored, I guess, you could always switch to the other country. All right. Aura and Labora in the house. Um, I like this game a lot. A lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. I am not sure where I place it with Agricola and Lahav yet. I still think Lahav's my favorite, and Agricola's my second favorite, and this is a di not a distant third, but a third. But if I play this game more as time goes by, this one might go up. This one is the most open-ended of the games because there's so much going on. But you can play this by yourself. You can play them all by yourself. Come on now. <laughs> Just get out Skyrim, okay? <laughs> um, the... But this, okay, I will say this. Agricola plays best with five. I think, four or five. I like it best with four or five. Although three's not bad. Lahav, I want to play with two or three and not more. This one, I'll play across the spectrum. Not, not solitaire. I don't like playing solitaire games. But this one is, is really open-ended. I mean, there's just so many buildings you can build and so much you can do. Mm -hmm. While Lahav, you kind of follow the track and Agricola, you say, we got to survive! Yes. That threat of survival is not in this one at all. Mm -mm. Um, Although the threat of being on the low point side is, is definitely there. I'll tell you what, though. In this game, I, I never have a clue of who is winning. Because there's I, so I don't, many different ways to There's score so points. many ways to points. Yeah. I can look at someone else's board, and I suppose I could sit there and count up all their points. But at a quick glance... But then you're not thinking about what you need to do on your turn. Yeah. Okay, things I like. Production wheel. I think that's a really cool mechanic. Yes. It's, it's really neat how it spins around and you move the pieces back. That's a good idea. In Lahav, you put the pieces on the space, and that was good. But even though I like Lahav better, this is better. Yes. Because you just have to move the wheel, and you take the resources. Right. The disconnect between the resources is a little less strong in this one. In the first one, it was like, ah, oh, I'm getting, in Lahav, I'm getting cattle, and I'm butchering them for meat. I need that for food. Here I'm getting clay, and then I'm changing it to pottery. What do you need pottery for? I don't know, but you know it seems cool, you know. And and I felt sometimes a disconnect there. No, yeah, well, I think I think it's it's not really a disconnect. It's just a long term connect because you're not using clay for really much of anything at the beginning of the game. Well, to build buildings. Right, but at near the end of the game, you're using um, all of these different things to create things like you know uh, uh, the. The, well, those wonders. The big colorful windows. Stained glass stained windows. Glass windows. There you go. I didn't show them in the overview, but there's these stained glass windows that are 30, 30 right. points, and you can trade in a whole bunch of resources for those. Yeah. They, they look like game killers. You're like, 30 points! But they're not. But I'll tell you, the game killer, in my opinion, are those dwellings that you can stick there and have all the buildings yes. add to them. If you do that properly, you can get a ton the of communities. points. That's, that's how I won the game um, uh, last time. And, I, and, and to, to be honest... I didn't think I had won the game because uh, I was one of the only people that didn't build a stained glass window, and so I thought, um, uh, I'm done. There's something I can do. Uh, but all of that different networking that I kind of did almost by accident uh, what, was what put me over the top. No, actually, I wasn't over the top. Now that I remember. Well, it was really close. Yes, We're talking like very, points. Very close. One thing I really like about this game, I mean, I'm, okay, I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. One thing that I'm not so fond of in this game is there's so much going on that I read lots of rules. As Sam, I'm always, I, sometimes I'll just come to the game and I'll read the rules and teach the game right there with no mistakes. Mm. Okay, it's a lie. <laughs> About the no mistakes part. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of... <laughs> that's, the, that's the joke in our group. I, I'll be reading, what? <laughs> Again? <laughs> but in this game, I read the rules and I was like, what is going on? There's, it's not... It almost needs a little person in the box who says, this is how you play the game, you know? <laughs> or maybe a CD. I mean, I got it now. And I could teach it very easily. Mm -hmm. But if you open the box and look at the rules, you'll be like, oh. there just seems to be so much going on. Yeah. Also, there'll be times you'll sit there and go, I have no idea what to do. There are so many buildings to build. There are so many things to go for. Mm -hmm. There's so much. What do I do? I guess I'll just take some more resources, which isn't a bad option. No. This has the same thing I like about Lahav. There's a bunch of good things you can do. Yeah. You're like, oh, I can't do that, you did that, well, I'll do this then, and you're happy. But for some people, that's gonna be overwhelming. 
Yeah, it, 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 it can be overwhelming. And you do need to search for the best option because there's a lot of good stuff that you can do, but there's only a few best things that you can do uh, to further along your cause for first place. So that is where the thinking comes in, in into, the, into the game. And that's where people are going to be kind of um, misty-eyed about it. I also know that the cards need to be small because the how much cards you're going to have in front mm. of you and stuff. But man... I was constantly like looking at people's cards and squinting, and you, you just—it's hard to see stuff. Right. Um, so, now I mean, I said some negative things there, but overall, this is the style of Euro game that I like: trading resource for other resources. But there's tons. To me, when you trade resources together, resources you're like, oh, what strategy am I going to follow? And this, you could just do so many different things. Mm -hmm. uh, it's time for beer. We'll go the beer route, or I'm going to do. Uh, you can chop down forest after forest. You can build your land to make a huge area. Uh, you can try to get a houseboat, and there's mm -hmm. just, I, I liked it. There was a, a wide open range. So I'm going to give this one, uh, come back, we'll come back in a year and see how I think of it compared to La Havre and Agricola, but for right now, I'm giving this two rakes up. Two rakes up. With all the prongs on being a thumb each. Well, <laughs> I'm doing a, um, a, a, a bushel of wheat. Two bushels of wheat. Wow! See, now this surprised me because Sam is not a big Euro gamer at no, all. No, I'm not. But this is the kind of Euro game that I do enjoy playing. I did enjoy Agricola. The problem I have with Agricola is that there was too much text on too many cards. Um, here, there's not a lot of text on the cards. They, not really. It's all... They do use a lot of icons, but the icons are not overdone. Um, there is... The scoring is fairly mathy at the end, though. Yes, it oh. is. And, and we <laughs> it's had... the calculator. Yeah. <laughs> we, had, we had to count each every, everybody's score a few times, so that does get a little bit mathy. I think the thing that puts it over the top for me, as far as Agricola and um, La Havre is concerned, is that production wheel. That just really simplified that, that area of the game. And I like when things are done that way that was simplified streamlined but the but the meat is still there so uh this gets uh two bushels of wheat up for me this is uh, a musket thanks so much for watching the dice tower videos find more great videos and reviews as well as our top rated audio podcast at dicetower.com you can also find the latest board game news at dicetowernews.com i'm eric summerer and you've been watching the dice tower the Dice Tower is sponsored by Fun Again Games, the world's best game source. Fun Again Games has over 5,000 games available. Check them out at funagain.com.